May it please the court. Ms. Jenish. Counsel. My name is Nan Jenish, and I'm with the Estate Appellate Defender's Office, and I'm here uh, appearing on behalf of Mr. Travis West. Um, he was convicted of delivery of a controlled substance and involuntary manslaughter based upon the commission of that delivery um, in the district court. And, um, and that, was within, that was in connection with the um, death of his friend from a heroin overdose. Um, on appeal, we raised several issues, and I wanted to concentrate today on the uh, main issue uh, for, on which we filed for further review um, from the Court of Appeals decision, and that is um, with regard to the merger issue. Um, it's our contention that the district court improperly imposed uh, punishment on the um, additional punishment on the delivery and that the court simply should have imposed punishment um, on the involuntary manslaughter under our merger statute under section 701.9. And it's our contention on further review that this court needs to reexamine the two-step um, analysis of merger issues um, that stems from the Halliburton case. And in th that case um, states that um, if the crimes meet the uh, Blockburger legal elements test, we look further for evidence of legislative intent for multiple punishments for two separate offenses. Um, we'd argued that Halliburton, um, at least with respect to the merger issue, um, and the cases that follow Halliburton should be overruled. Well, let's take a look at Halliburton. That's uh, the first case in a line. And it, it, it strikes me as interesting. Uh, we have two crimes, of course, um, possession of a firearm and possession of the same firearm as a felon. And they're both Class D felonies. And, and, and Halliburton basically says, well, if they merge, we basically eliminate this, the second statute, um, um, possession of, felon as, of a firearm as a felon. And so that can't be. Um, and so, as you know, Halliburton uh, held that merger did not occur based on the second step in Blackburger. Um, on its facts, doesn't, doesn't Halliburton strike you as maybe correct? Um, it's, you know, you basically eliminate a statute if, if they merge, and the, the, the statute, possession of firearm as a felon, would have no application ever. Right, so push back. Well, I think, first of all, Halliburton and the cases that have followed actually have improperly imported the double jeopardy analysis, the federal double jeopardy, uh, jeopardy analysis, onto the merger issue. Um, and let me go back to the Supreme Court cases that talk about uh, that analysis, it's, that's where the two-step test comes from. And the cases such as um, Hunter and Whalen, those cases say, first of all, when we, we look at, but we look at the main issue is what is legislative intent? And, and those cases say that first, we look at, to, to, at the statutes to see whether is, there is a statute which specifically authorizes multiple punishments for the same crime, the same offense. And in that case, <clears throat> if there's a specific statute that provides for that, multiple punishments, then that's the end of the analysis. But if there is no clear legislative intent, made cl I mean, if there's no clear expression of legislative intent, um, then we do look at the Blockburger test to determine whether or not the offenses are the same under the double jeopardy analysis. Conversely, um, conversely, these cases have said that the Blockburger test isn't determinative. But it's not determinative um, when there is the existence of another statute which specifically provides that. And what I think that Halliburton and the cases that have followed Halliburton have done is actually 
hung their hat on that statement that Blackberger um, isn't determinative, and um, and in those the Halliburton line of cases have actually um, not even considered the murder statute at all. It's glossed over it. In in other words, these cases have looked at the merger statute as a tool of statutory interpretation rather than um, but they, an expression Dennis, of legislative they, I, I agree maybe they've glossed over it, but they've talked about it. Certainly our court was aware of uh, 701.9. These cases have been around for over 20 years now. There are several of them. The legislature hasn't changed the statute. We haven't changed the law. Isn't it time for a stare decisis at this point? Well, on the other hand, our cases, we, this court has said too that sometimes statutes are not changed or amended um, due to default or inattention and not so much uh, because of any kind of conscious or collective decision. Um, so the fact that this Justice, Justice Carter has raised in his concurrences, has raised time and time again, at least in three cases, that we've been analyzing merger wrong. And um, so their concurrences, and of course they don't have the effect that um, our majority well, I, decisions would And I, I understand that 701.9, you read it, it doesn't seem to allow for any exceptions. But then, on the other hand, if you really ask the legislature, what, what, what did you intend in this case? You know, and your argument is that we need to get back maybe to what the legislature wanted. I think they would say probably, uh, yeah, when someone delivers heroin and then the her the, a person has an overdose and dies, that you that the uh, that the of offense ought to be punishable. Both offenses should be punishable. They should have the class D felony and the class C felony instead of having the class C felony merge into the class D felony. That 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 seems to me to to uh, eliminate any sanction for the fact that the person was killed, right? But we're stuck with. We're stuck with the clear, plain language of 701.9, and that statute clearly applies to all cr crimes in the criminal code, and in the absence of any other statute, any sentencing statute that provides an exception for that, we're stuck with, with 701.9, and if the, the offenses meet the elements test under the merger statute, then that's the end of the analysis. That's the last yeah. word on, in, uh, on legislative intent. In because yeah, in fact, it's really even more counterintuitive than I said because in this particular case, your client would end up with a lesser penalty because somebody died than he would have ended up with if no one had died, right? Well, they shouldn't have charged I mean, under your theory, they shouldn't have charged him with some more serious crime. They, they, they should have, they, instead of having the two, the two charges. They should have just charged him with the delivery. Just, just charge him with delivery under your theory, I, I guess, is because there'd be more, then there wouldn't be a merger because you wouldn't have alleged uh, the more uh, serious crime. Does that make any sense? Well, again, I, we have to look at, I, I go back to the statute. And really, I understand the position that, that this may lead to a, uh, an anomalous result, um, but but we have to look at the statute, and this court cannot read any anything more into the words of the statute than are there. And if the Unless court finds that it, it's a problem, then it's really up to the legislature to fix that problem. If there, if it finds that that's not what they intended, I mean, I'm sympathetic to the notion that we shouldn't have a crooked stick and go looking for kind of legislative intent when there's multiple char crimes charged. But the cases don't quite do that. I mean, cases like Halliburton, and arguably a case like the one we're considering today, um, it, just, it just almost makes no sense to enforce the literal language of the statute where you have 
where, where the end result, for example, in Halliburton, you, you didn't quite answer the question, but I, but I think there's no answer to the question <laughs> because under Halliburton, um, a different interpretation would basically say the crime of possession of a firearm as a felon would have no effect. And then in this particular case, I think the thrust of your argument ends up being the state should have charged the less serious crime um, um, because of the effect of the merger rule. That strikes me, shall I say, as uh, odd. Um, and there's a point at which we don't end up with absurd results under a statute. But on the other hand, they could have just charged him with the involuntary manslaughter alone and be stuck with the, the, the Class D felony there. And I, and I would also bring up the fact that I, I think part of what this court is getting at is that um, the notion that someone uh, who provides heroin to another person and then that person dies, that could only get five years in prison. Um, Judge Blink below expressed that uh, concern, criticism, um, and on appeal, um, Judge Doyle said the same thing. But again, that's 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 what the legislative that's the penalty that the legislature has fixed for that crime. So I'm not so much saying that they could have just decided to to charge them with delivery alone. Um, Certainly, I mean, that's what the prosecution could have decided if they wanted a greater penalty. But I'm, I'm going back a little bit further. Um, I'm not persuaded. Help me understand how um, I believe in, your, in the brief it may have said that the defense's position is it's impossible to commit the greater offense of involuntary without the lesser offense. I'm looking at the jury instructions, and help me understand that you say it's impossible to do one without having the other one completely included. Well, we look at the actual elements. And that's um, what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the jury instructions, which, which right. are going to be the law of the case. I'm looking at them. Right. But in looking at merger, I mean, we look at the jury instructions to determine what alternative applies here. Um, and under the different alternative, um, here is that uh, involuntary manslaughter by the commission of delivery of a controlled substance. And I, I think where you're getting at is that the delivery uh, of uh, controlled substance specifies a specific drug. Absolutely, that's what I'm getting at, because it said heroin in the instruction. Right, but in looking at whether or not one offense merges with another, we look at the elements of the crime, um, not the facts, specific facts of the case. So in, in doing a side-by-side -side, uh, comparison of the actual statutes and the elements in the statute as they are um, as they are written in the statutes, you can see that um, all the elements of involuntary manslaughter include the elements of delivery. And for that reason, delivery is a lesser included. Even not looking at the specific facts, am I correct that one of them requires, uh, has unintentionally caused the death? The other one, the delivery, um, the person knew it was a heroin or whatever it may be. So one requires intent and one does not, correct? No, because I think that the uh, subsumed in that, in the involuntary manslaughter, is, is the, the delivery, and that would therefore include all the elements of delivery. Just because it didn't spell it out, is that what you're saying? Is that the involuntary manslaughter um, instruction doesn't spell out that the person knew that the substance was... Uh, heroin is that is that what you're getting at? It, it just generally says according delivery. to the, um, the instructions that I'm looking at, it's not required. It's unintentional. They don't need to know um, because you, you've answered it. Thank you. Yeah. So um, again, the, could you help me out? Yeah. I'm a devout adherent to stare decisis, and we have all this. We've declined it. I mean. Justice Carter's, Carter's uh, special concurrence didn't persuade his colleagues at the time. Uh, why should we go that way now? I, I think that, um, as I said, um, I, I think that Halliburton has analyzed merger all wrong. And just, and I think that, um, and I think that, um, 
they've actually conflated the, the analysis where I think for merger purposes, we just need to look at the face of the statute. And, and Halliburton in specifically has, I think the main problem is Halliburton looks at the merger statute as a tool of, le, of statutory construction rather than looking at as a, the final word on the um, expression of legislative intent. Thank you. Ms. Janish, thank you as well. Mr. Mullins. Good afternoon. May it please the court. I'd like to untangle lesser included offenses. And I think in the process I can address the specific issues that you raised in the jury instructions and your question about the genesis of this concern following Halliburton. I think what we need to do, of course, is start back with Jeffries. Jeffries was recognizing, that's back in 88. Jeffries is recognizing that for purposes of determining a lesser included offense, we're going to go with the statutory elements. All right? And then whether you submit a particular lesser included offense is determined by the, uh, the jury function theory, which is to say the court's not going to get involved in picking which facts of a, which lesser is supported by the facts. Now, move forward, uh, we understand from McNitt that what we're all really talking about here is whether it's impossible to commit the lesser when you have committed the greater. Now, there was some concern in the lower courts of the other states about whether the double jeopardy clause even acted as any kind of a break on legislative pronouncement. And Missouri versus Hunter said no. The only application of the double jeopardy clause for purposes of legislative pronouncement is whether, it's what the, le is whether the legislature has intended a series of punishments that the judiciary can enact. And the reason for that was because Missouri had two statutes, and one of which said, in effect, uh, this punishment will be in addition to anything else. And the Missouri Supreme Court said, well, that violates double jeopardy. And so the United States Supreme Court said, well, we understand we had Blockburger, but let's all back up here a moment. That vernacular is probably somewhere in a footnote. We have to consider primarily the legislative intent. And so where the legislative intent comes out from the, from the code, that's going to govern. And so I think that's the understanding of what the lesser included offense analysis is. We, if it's obvious from the face of a particular statute, your task is likely done. If it's not, you can consider Blackburger or Blockburger analysis. But either way, it's a two-step test. That's all. I, I agree with all that. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to cut in. But the statute itself, I'm just reading from it. You know the words as well as I do. Um, no person shall be convicted. I mean, this isn't, a, this isn't a tool of legislative interpretation, I don't think. Convince me otherwise. No person shall be convicted of a public offense which is necessarily included in another public offense for which the person is convicted, period. So if the elements, I mean, it seems to me that's the legal impossibility test uh, with respect to the elements. It doesn't go on to say dot, 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 unless the legislature intended otherwise. I will tell you, I'll tell the world in Halliburton that, you know, it was, it was a fairly compelling argument was put together that, my heavens, um, if, you, if you just use the legal impossibility test, you end up with one crime, not two crimes. That can't be. And, and as a matter of logic, I find that, you know, quite powerful. Um, yet, what the legislature did is just have a one-step process. And, and, you know, tell me otherwise. So f in the following years, and, and actually just to be clear, not to, not, not to make my task any more difficult, but, but the dilemma that you identify goes back a little further to Gallup. So it really isn't necessarily just Halliburton that we're thinking about. We're going from Gallup Certainly all the agree. way on up. Yeah. And in that interval of time, this court has consistently said that there's a two-step process and that 701.9 embraces, in fact, is coterminous but with this jeopardy. I mean, that's the issue. I mean, I understand we, we, we said that, but you look at the language and, I mean, it's not in the language. Are we, are we kind of 
I mean, the argument is we're kind of writing it in, we're carrying it in because we don't like the results. Is that something that we ought to be doing? Not at all, because we also consider the variety of principles of statutory construction that we use to define legislative intent. If ah. you, by the way, and not to interrupt, I'm sorry, but if you do read that statute in as cramped a fashion as you do, then we have to strike out or at least not consider any of the specific language that the legislature has implemented for second degree murder, voluntary manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter, operation of a motor vehicle without the owner's consent, conspiracy. Because in all of those instances, those, less, those purported lessers, they're not lessers of the greater. But there's specific language in the code that says this is a lesser. Now we could flip that on its head. We have okay, a and in what was the case, Cerruti or Ceretti, where Ceretti. We, we we did that on our own. We just said this is a lesser of this, even though, or we applied what we called the one homicide rule, even though in fact they aren't. The legislature hadn't hadn't directed that at all. So as you all know, I am perfectly happy to defend the many the many headed hydra of all variety of cases as they've come up and forth. I'm less in this instance concerned about the outcomes of any of the particular cases where the court determined one was a lesser of another. Okay? I'm more concerned with the test itself. The test itself is a two part test. Now we may disagree with how any particular iteration of this court has concluded any specific elements or you know, require one offense to be a lesser of another. But just for good measure, I will say that the cases in the following, in the 30 years or more that have followed Gallup and, and Jeffries, uh, I have little difficulty with them. Um, they do recognize a common sense notion um, that we can apply, implement, apply methods of statutory construction and the Blockburger test, if it's not already obvious from the face of the statute, uh, or you can flip it around the other way. Likely, what happens is you get a particular statute, and for my money, Gallup didn't need to start with an elements analysis. They could have gone straight ahead to the lack of immunity statute and recognized right there that resolved the, that resolved the issue. But the court has recognized that there's going to be instances where it's a benefit to discuss whether a lesser or the purported crime is a lesser of another even though we know that in the end of the analysis, it makes no sense whatsoever to um, render nugatory the involuntary manslaughter statute. Um, there is a perverse incentive when you've delivered cocaine that uh, if somebody should die from it, your situation becomes better. And we do, as prosecutors, have an obligation to charge those offenses for which there is a substantial evidence for. So I'm you read 701 to say, no person shall be convicted of a public offense which is necessarily included in another public offense of which a person is convicted, comma, except where absurd. Well, Your Honor, I won't. That's Halliburton, in my view. Um, if I may, I'm going to decline the bait and say that any time we read a statute, uh, we have to understand the history of this court's interpretation from it. The necessarily included language, as this court has said time and again, is the Blockburger elements test. The, we are engrafting the federal government's analysis for double, for double jeopardy. This is how Iowa has chosen to implement it. And I, for one, am, am comfortable with that. And, and if I might just maybe proceed a little forward and, and answer Justice Christensen's inquiry about the specific parts of this offense that allow me to conclude that this is not a lesser included offense of another. And in, and in part because it will help inform the history of this lesser included offense analysis. When Jeffries came around, it said we're going to use this strict elements approach. But even then, it adhered to the Sangster and, um, and Webb caveat, right, that all you're going to do for clarity's sake, you're just going to look at the elements of a given offense, but if an alternative definition of an offense has been charged, you're going to look at that. And now in this particular, and then you ask, is it impossible to commit the lesser when you've committed, to not commit the lesser when you've committed the greater? And the answer here is, it is in fact possible to commit delivery of a controlled substance. 
because in this instance, all that the charging document specified was a controlled substance, and there are a variety of them, from methamphetamine through cocaine and, and so on and so forth down the line. The lesser, the purported lesser offense here was specific delivery of heroin. And so to not, to maybe just to make this as, as bone simple as I can, delivery of heroin is not a lesser of involuntary manslaughter by controlled substance. In short, delivery required proof of heroin, but not death. And manslaughter required proof of death, but not heroin. So irrespective of the facts of this case, I understand we're just talking about one instance of delivery of heroin. But now that we have the law of the case and we, in effect, use these, as we're comparing these particular elements, it is entirely possible to, for example, commit involuntary manslaughter because you've delivered a bad batch of methamphetamine. And it's also possible to have committed um, delivery of a controlled substance because you've delivered heroin or marijuana or something like that. Now, um, for these particular reasons, I think that we can fairly safely say that, or at least I believe we can safely say that while Justice Carter's concurrence has gained no traction uh, in earlier iterations of his court, nor has it persuaded members of the, of the legislature to step in and correct the court's interpretation for the last 30 some odd years. Uh, we give that legislative inaction um, much weight. Um, I prefer to, um, because Justice Wiggins has enjoyed so much letting a vein out of my neck, uh, and I've dribbled my way back to the bench whenever I um, mention. Oh, he uh, he stepped out of the room, so go ahead. I didn't take that personally, uh, though I did gratefully. Um, the my view is legislative acquiescence is something of a helpful make weight argument. Um, in the absence of more affirmative indication from, le from the legislature. It's like any other method of statutory construction. It tends to be the weapon that we reach for, um, which, have, which is most handy, and often we find our opponent with something just as menacing. Let me ask you about an evidentiary question, the 404B. Um, there were a number of challenges, um, one related to the phone calls made to SNAP on the day. Um, uh, in question, another related to um, a prior overdose. Uh, don't have any problems with those coming in, frankly. But then there's a, then there's uh, also evidence came in that the defendant um, delivered heroin on prior occasions. And I want to I want to focus on the def defendant delivering heroin on prior occasions. Uh, of course, you cannot offer that f for the purpose of showing. Um, similar acts occurred on the date of the death. Now you, the, the general notion is you have to introduce it for some other purpose other than showing conformity with, with prior acts. Um, help me with the other purpose um, of that evidence. Um, and and uh, Judge Vitiswaran did a better job of, of um, sifting this, that particular component of this than I, than I did for sure. Um, her observation, which I think was correct, was below the defense did not object to the testimony. Clearly true, but then it would be ineffective assistance. Possibly. Um, but uh, their, their complaint was with the quantity, and evidently we kept out the I agree with that, and kept frankly, and I suppose we could put it over to PCR. Um, on the ground that there was some strategy. What was the strategy? Well, uh, what was their strategy? I, I wouldn't wonder. hazard a guess. Uh, <laughs> it's not my job to, um, at, until I am assigned the post-conviction relief uh, well, let me, appeal. But uh, well, let me ask you a question, Mr. Miles. It strikes me that the, the time of these de timing of these deliveries might matter because there was evidence in the record that uh, he was there when she had a prior overdose, like a year before. So if he delivered heroin to her after that, if there was evidence of that, then that might go to his recklessness, which was the needed as mens rea for manslaughter. 
If it's before, I might feel differently. So do you know what the timing was? I don't know what the timing was, but for my money, I don't know that it really does matter. Um, my, in my estimation, because to prove recklessness, we have to show some basis for his knowledge that what he was doing was truly reckless. And so if he gave yeah. the drugs to her before her overdose, it's the overdose that puts him on notice that the further deliveries is going to be dangerous. If he gave the drugs to her after the overdose, it's doubly damning that he has done so yet again. I mean, I think the notice thing, I don't have any trouble with, with the prior over, that he had knowledge of the prior overdose. That, that comes in clearly on recklessness. Um, but if it was prior, if, if, if these, these acts were prior to that, I mean, I'm not sure it has much probative value at all. We know, we know that West himself was a heroin user. We admitted that. Um, he knew that um, uh, there was a prior overdose at some, at some time. Um, but, but if there were acts prior to that time, I, 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 it's hard for me to see how it's relevant for any purpose. Uh, well, I guess I, I, I differ uh, because I think, for one thing, for recklessness, we're going to have to show the nature of their relationship, the risks that he took. All right. Now, if, as I tried to explain, if he had supplied her with heroin before she overdosed, he would certainly put her on. That is, I don't think that's a great deal different than if he gave her heroin afterwards. But the two of them, the two of it together, suggests why it would be dangerous to have done so again. And so that would be the alternative theory or the basis for um, uh, under our rule of evidence 404B. And with that, um, we respectfully request that this court affirm the judgment of the district court below. Thank you. Mr. Mullins, thank you. Ms. Janice, you may present your rebuttal. May please the court. I wanted to respond to Justice Apple's concerns about the, um, the prior delivery of drugs to the victim. And I really don't think that the timing of, of that, um, the delivery matters. I, I think that what we'd argue, I, I think that the record seems to suggest that, and I think that the state has argued that um, I could be wrong, but it could be, um, I think that in looking at the, um, the actual recording or listening to the actual recording, I think there was some reference that this was, um, this delivery was around this time of the, uh, state fair. But regardless, I, I think that, um, the real question there is prejudice because it, it's, it's involving not only drug activity, but it's involving the exact same crime for which he is on trial. And in terms, in, in this, and- no, but if you fall back on the prejudice, it has to substantially, you know, you, you know the wording of the 404 Right. I mean, the prejudice has to substantially overweigh its relevance. Um, and but, I, but I also think that in terms of looking at the prejudice, we look at what other evidence the state had of recklessness and in going back to the um well, the other evidence was knew about a prior i mean right and that evidence. that that in itself is evidence of recklessness could be relevant um the fact that he's a drug addict he knows the dangers um the fact that he uh, in his interview talked about her extensive history with drugs uh knowing the uh the effects that that had on her, I think those are other evidence, that's other evidence of recklessness. And I think, um, and then on that basis, we'd argue that it substantially outweighs any any marginal relevance that it has. Okay, but, so, but, but to cut to, on one of the factual issues, in terms of the timing, you're telling us that the record is, well, is I have a to, little unclear. It, it is unclear, I All think, right. that because Looking, uh, if we look at what the state argued in closing argument, they just made a broad statement that he had delivered uh, to her in the past. And so um, it, it's unclear there. 
What did the record show? I mean, the record show was about the state fair time, apparently. I mean, I, I, this I missed in the record. Does the record tell us at all whether this was before or after the heroin overdose? It is unclear. I just do recall it's been that it, it was around the state fair time. So for what's that worth? Um, uh, General position then is the probative value wasn't worth much because exactly. there was plenty of evidence of recklessness and that it was substantially prejudicial. Right, because it's essentially piling on evidence there. Um, and again, we'd go back to the whole idea of stare decisive, and I, uh, decisive, excuse me. And I think that this court, in, in other contexts, uh, particularly with um, you know the case that comes to mind is Hamstra, where this court found that um, where the willful injury is the act which causes the murder, which is as a basis for the murder, um, this court has uh, on on occasion overruled a whole line of cases and um, I, and in that case there I mean with Heemstra you know I remember you know doing criminal defense work before that case was decided and we all thought that was crazy I mean that it seemed totally unjust it transformed many many just ordinary murders into felony murder and um, that you know whereas here it's hard to see that the equities lie as they did in Heemstra with the, with the defendant. Am I, am I missing something? Well, again, we have to look at the court has to interpret the statute as it's written. And if, um, you know, there, we do have to take into consideration whether or not an interpretation of the statute may result in, in an absurd result. But that's only in instances where the uh, statute isn't clear and the legislative intent isn't clear, and therefore we can then take that into consideration. But we're stuck with what the legislature has said, how it applies to all criminal um, You know, after, after Heemster, one of the uh, benefits of stare decisis is predictability and stability of the law. Then Heemster changed it, um, and that was 2006. And, and, and just even in recent years, we're still dealing with the follow-up litigation over that. Are we going to have the same issue in this case, hypothetically, if we went with, if we changed, overruled our precedent, accepted uh, Justice Carter's approach, are we going to see a wave of PCRs by people in prison now that that want a change in, uh, that want a fresh, that want relief? I think I would have just looked at Heemstra. And in that case, the court held that uh, that that holding would apply to cases that are pending on appeal, and it applied to Mr. Heemstra. And I think that uh, I think I'm concerned about Mr. West, and I think that he deserves a benefit of of that. And um, and so the court can specify whether it's prospective or retroactive. Thank you. And for the reasons argued in the brief and today, we'd ask that this court. Uh, reverse his convictions, uh, remand for a new trial, or alternatively, remand for resentencing. Thank you. Ms. Janish, thank you as well. Mr. Mullins, thank you again. The case of State versus West is now then submitted, and the bailiff may adjourn court. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.